I'm here to talk about the implications of the horrible terrorist attacks on uh, the people of Mumbai, most importantly, but also on, uh, as well as attacks on people. There were also attacks on uh, Indian icons. The Taj Hotel, remember, was uh, built uh, by an Indian industrialist at a time when many of the hotels in Mumbai were uh, closed to Indians uh, as a symbol of um, you know, Indian nationalism, Indian pride, Indian ability to uh, build this fabulous symbol of the city um, you know, for Indians, open to Indians at a time when India was a colony. Um, there's lots of expertise on the panel, and looking around, I see there's an awful lot of expertise uh, on Mumbai uh, in the audience as well. So before introducing our, our panelists uh, one by one, I just want to offer three brief reflections from the perspective of uh, someone who follows Indian domestic politics, which is one of my areas. Firstly, uh, the implications for domestic communal peace of the events that took place. It's striking to me that there has been no massive violent backlash directed against members of India's 13% uh, Muslim uh, community. The BJP, uh, the Hindu right more generally, the Shiv Sena, uh, have not launched angry mass demonstrations or facilitated riots or pogroms as they did in uh, Gujarat in 2002. And that's despite allegations of some involvement by local Islamic militants uh, assisting those who carried out the attack, probably from lashkar e -Toyba. Um Muslim organizations in their turn, Indian Muslim organizations, have publicly protested the attacks and even refused burial to the attackers in graveyards uh, that the community controlled in Mumbai. Now, there's been a lot of criticism, much of it well-deserved, against uh, India's law and order machinery and India's governments. But from the perspective of somebody with an interest in communal harmony in India, uh, India's state governments, and in India, law and order is a state subject controlled by the 28 uh, state governments, they have, in fact, generally done very well over the past five years in preventing... Uh, conflicts between Hindus and Muslims, which in the Indian context usually means uh, attacks on Muslims by Hindus in which Muslims uh, suffer uh, disproportionately. Uh, there have been two reasons for this, I think. Firstly, in terms of state politics, India uh, is a highly competitive political system in every state, almost every state, in which caste identities and other identities cross-cut the Muslim-Hindu cleavage uh, and help to um, create lots of competition within the Hindu community over all kinds of issues, as well as to some extent amongst the Muslim community. And this makes Muslims a very important and critical uh, community to appeal to. And therefore, politicians have a natural incentive in most states to offer protection to the Muslim community simply because if they don't need Muslim votes today, they're likely to need Muslim votes tomorrow. And that's a powerful dynamic, I think, that's been promoting... Uh, peace in many Indian states. It's striking to me that if you look at 2002, we think of things in terms of the Gujarat riots. But in fact, there were attempts to foment large-scale riots throughout many Indian states in 2002. And those attempts were largely successfully um, you know, stopped and prevented by very strong police actions, sometimes involving firing on those who were going to commit the riots. This isn't to under um, play the, uh, the importance of the Gujarat riots by any means. It's to say that there's also another story that's going on, that's been a very strong um, state action in order to try and prevent violence. There's a second reason, I think, why communal violence has also been lower in the past five years, and that's because you have had a Congress government at the top that um, owes uh, allegiance, uh, that relies extensively, uh, both directly and indirectly through its coalition partners, on uh, minority votes, and that gives it a powerful incentive uh, to warn state governments that if you uh, let something happen in your particular state or if you foment it, as was done under a BJP central government in 2002, we will take strong action against you. For instance, in Vadodara in May 2006, uh, in the state of Gujarat, uh, Chief Minister Modi called in the army very quickly when communal violence broke out because he had been given uh, quite severe warnings by the center that if he did not do so and massive violence was allowed to break out, um, he could expect central intervention. So that central um, you know, shift in the composition of the government and the, the government's views has altered state-level politics in addition to this longer-term state uh, political development that I've been talking about. Um, 
that's the good news. Um, however, there are still a few states uh, like Gujarat that I think you know, the politics are different in those states for reasons I've gone into at greater length in published work. And there's also negative news, I think, about the uh, economic and social marginalization of the Muslim community. Uh, I'll, I'll just give you one instance of that. There's been a lot written on this by Zoya Hassan, Mushir al Hassan, and many others. Um, but there's recently, for the first time, been a study using techniques that have been used in economics in the U.S., where you have matched candidates apply for jobs, and you see who gets the phone back, where the uh, resumes are absolutely identical. This has been done by Bertrand and uh, Malaynatan um, in, in a very well-cited paper. And it's also been done more recently by a group of people, uh, Paul Atwell, Catherine Newman, Sukde, Torat, and others in India. What they find is that if you have absolutely identical candidates um, who apply for a job and the caste Hindu's chances of a callback are one, the uh, scheduled caste uh, chances of a callback are two-thirds of those chances, but the chances for Muslims are even worse. One-third chance of a caste Hindu of identically matched uh, applicants being called back. So for the first time we're seeing some uh, actual information that gets at the degree of marginality of the populations. And this is a l huge challenge for India that the Satchar Committee several years ago completely failed to address. And perhaps we can talk about that a little bit later. Secondly, um, how will the violence affect the elections next year, uh, the national elections, this is, when the, uh, the government's term is up? So initially, uh, when the violence took place, there was really a ra rally around the flag uh, effect in which uh, senior BJP party leaders said that this is not the time for politics and we ought to support the government in pressing very hard through di diplomatic and international pressure. But as that has seemed not to work and as Pakistani uh, positions have affirmed about uh, A, it may not be our responsibility and B, there are limits to what we can do with regard to our own national sovereignty, there has been an increasingly um, divisive atmosphere in Indian national politics. Uh, the BJP is now blaming the Congress's inability to successfully get Pakistan to act in reigning in lashkar e toiba and other groups uh, on its own Muslim support base. Uh, BJP spokesman uh, Prakash uh, Javadikar last week said that, quote, the way the new Home Minister is seeking to absolve Pakistan of its complicity in the Mumbai attacks, we are constrained to think that the UPA, that's the national government, is back to its old ways dictated by vote bank politics. Right? And to people who are in India, that vote bank politics carries a very clear implication that it's because of your reliance on minority votes that you're not taking a stronger um, perspective on these kinds of issues. He also accused Manmohan Singh of being soft on terror for having said in 2006, after the Mumbai bomb blast then, that Pakistan was, quote, also a victim of terror. So you're seeing this emerge much more at national level as a clear dividing uh, issue. I think it probably increases the chances of someone of the right of the BJP, which has been in really a, a leadership tussle for the past year or so, or, or so over who's going to succeed the older generation of national leaders, probably increases the chances of someone on the right of the party being uh, the prime ministerial candidate. Only a couple of days ago, two leading industrialists, uh, Mittal and uh, Anil Ambani, Fated Gujarat Chief Minister uh, Narendra Modi, the architect of the 2002 riots and pogroms, as prime ministerial candidate, uh, and speculated on, given what he'd achieved for Gujarat, what he could do for India in the future at this trying time. What, indeed. Um, that said, Indian elections tend not to be monocausal. India is a complex place with 28 different states, and different issues have traditionally been important in different ways in different states. Foreign policy tends not to win Indian elections. The only clear case I can think of where there's a massive effect is the 1971 uh, elections after the uh, India-Pakistan uh, war. So uh, working out what the electoral effect will be in the national elections next year probably has a lot more to do with coalition agreements uh, prior to uh, the election than it does with the specific impact of this one event, which may have more important legacy for inter-party politics than it does for inter-party politics. Third, I just want to close by wondering, will India launch surgical strikes against Pakistan that could start a longer war? There are training camps whose locations are relatively well known in uh, Pakistani-occupied Kashmir or Azad Kashmir, depending on your perspective, uh, and in uh, Punjab and elsewhere. And there is pressure, of course, on the Indian government to act in a, quote, surgical way um, 
on these particular camps. Um, but really, I think what this has shown is, is the, the stabilizing effect of nuclear weapons, right, which is perhaps no surprising conclusion from somebody at uh, Chicago where um, you know, people often um, have argued for the stabilizing effect of uh, nuclear weapons on conflict. In fact, the BJP's own response in, um, in 2001 to the attack on the uh, Indian parliament by people from lashkar e Toiba uh, and jaish e Mohammed was a lot of talk RSS, Shiv Sena, BJP leaders were all saying, we need to act strongly, uh, pressing for surgical strikes on Pakistan at that time. Um, and they didn't do it. You had this long standoff for about 10 months on the border. But even at that stage, there was no uh, attempt to launch these kind of strikes. So rhetorically, there's an enormous difference in policy. But in terms of actual actions, it's hard to see uh, so much uh, of a difference. Uh, Manmohan Singh in 2001, uh, at that time he was leader of the coalition, uh, leader of the opposition, said that India should, quote, convince the members of the international community that what's applicable in dealing with the terrorists in Afghanistan must also be applicable to these Pakistani-backed uh, terrorists who have perpetrated such a ghastly act on the Indian territory. But he then went on to say uh, that any loose talk or think of these surgical strikes has to, quote, give way to a sober analysis of political and military consequences of the various options open to us. And I suspect for both the BJP and for Congress, uh, that's where this is headed, that when people think about the enormous risks of launching surgical strikes on a somewhat unpredictable and unstable nuclear-armed neighbor, um, that's enormous pause for thought. Um, the fact is that uh, Pakistan has said it would respond, quote, within minutes to Indian, any Indian attack, and that makes all the strategic options look pretty grim for India. So on uh, that note, I'd like to uh, start to move on to our panelists. We're going to have a slight change from uh, the posted order. Uh, Tarani Bedi, who's a Mumbai car, um, is going to uh, begin with some personal reflections um, on the events, and then we're going to go after that in the order that's posted on the program. Tarani. Um, okay, thanks so much. Uh, thank you so much, Stephen. Um, i just like to start off, actually, by saying that um, when trauma and violence like the kind that happened in, in Mumbai um, between November 26th and November 29th strike urban regions of the world that are linked to, are assumedly linked to transnational um, flows of global capital, it's very easy, I think, to assume that human reactions and the political fallout to these events are actually universal. What has happened in Mumbai, I think, has definitely, in the short term at least, uh, hit Indian commerce and industry, I think, very, very seriously. The tourism and investment sector have been hit particularly badly. Many of us, for example, actually saw several Western tourists on the media coming out, many of whom were even uh, victims of the terrorist attacks, come out and say, you know, go out and buy a ticket to India and visit this wonderful country. However, in December and January, traditionally two of the busiest months for Indian tourism, any tourist or business visitor who could actually stayed away from India. What I really want to stress here, which is really the first point I want to make, is that what has happened since September 11th is that any reasoned political discourse about suicide bombings and terrorism in various parts of the world has become mixed up with and often subsumed under this specter of a global threat to the US and its allies. And I think similarly, I, all of the, the research context of any serious examination of what international terrorism really means has largely been framed through this universal discourse on counterterrorism. And I think I'd like us to revisit here this attempt to subsume the Mumbai attacks under this existing counter-terrorism discourse, because in many ways, I think that is what the Indian government and many informed Indian citizens are actually asking for. When Condi Rice, for example, visited South Asia right after the attacks last year, there was a significant amount of hope among Indians that US pressure on Pakistan to reframe the discourse on cross-border militancy would be beneficial to India. As the days went on, in fact, uh, it became quite evident that US action was going to conform, or at least this is what Indians felt, to the existing counter-terrorism paradigm that was set in many ways after September 11th and focused almost entirely on Al-Qaeda and American interests. 
The mood in India, I think, has really changed through this realization that this counter-terror discourse has failed in many ways to reflect the specificity of the problem that is facing India. And there really is a feeling, I would say, of betrayal among Indians, among many Indians. Now, undoubtedly, I'll, I'll preface this, I mean, I'll, I'll say that Indian democracy itself, and I think uh, certainly I, I'm sure uh, Martha and Bob will speak a lot more to this, is that it is incredibly flawed with fault lines in Kashmir and the brutal resurgence of Hindu su uh, nationalist supremacy that has made the finger pointing not uncomplicated. But I think it's also important, I think, in an, to an audience like this to really realize that the deep sense of betrayal that existing paradigms of counterterrorism have spawned in many parts of the world. Now, when I ask us to revisit this counterterrorism paradigm in the case of Mumbai, I'd also like to suggest that there are indeed some universal imaginaries of terrorist violence. The spectacle of violence, of terrorist violence, has significant transnational uh, and universally potent symbolic components, aided closely, I will say, by television, internet, text messaging, etc. Many of us here, um, you know, as transnational audiences of the spectacle in Mumbai and the enormously large Indian diaspora with connections to Mumbai who were linked in their horror through technological tools such as, you know, Twitter and blogs and Facebook, etc., was really quite astounding. I myself actually followed the horror of two old school classmates who were trapped in the Taj Hotel through reports of common friends on blogs and Twitter. Now, this sounds somewhat trivial, but I think the ways in which audiences are constituted through shared narratives of survival, that how audiences are produced through these spectacles of terror and horror, is not unimportant, I think, in an analysis of the technologies of terror. However, I think Mumbai was also a very particular case in many ways because the nature of the ways in which the attacks unfolded where the experience of terrorist violence gets narrated almost in real time and where those who were actually lucky enough to survive are able to recount the interactions, conversations between the terrorists, following and understanding conversations between the attackers and their handlers far away are very significant. And they're not just significant in doing what the Indian police and intelligence have used them for, which is to try to, um, to trace the originators of the mission. But I think most of us who are interested in understanding the human intentionality and motivations of a terrorist such as this have much to gain, I think, by tracing this sort of data. And I think it's particularly important in this case to also recognize the nature of these attackers. These 10 men who attacked Mumbai, I think, were really ordinary enough to remain under the intelligence radar, very young, very limited in terms of their education, quite different actually from the attackers that, that, uh, came, uh, that attacked on September 11th, and m marginalized in their own societies. But they're extraordinary enough to use incredibly sophisticated 21st century gadgets like voice inscription technology, satellite phones, GPS, technologies that many in the Indian police and, um, and uh, anti-terror squad were actually not even familiar with. Even in the aftermath of the attacks, these technologies uh, became, in fact, that were the instruments of the spectacle, became, I think, in a profoundly perverse way, also the instruments that, um, dare I say, humanized the lone surviving terrorist, Mr. Ajmal Kasab, who was captured by the Mumbai police. So throughout the, uh, in the month following the attacks, um, we heard through the technologies of media and blogs and things like that, that Mr. Kasab, who was being held at the Mumbai's Arthur Road Jail, had admitted to being a Pakistani national, that he had described in great detail his training and the Mumbai mission. But we also heard regularly about what he was eating, that he had requested uh, a customary new set of clothes on Bakri Eid, and that he had appealed unsuccessfully to the Pakistani consulate for legal assistance. Now, anyone familiar with the imprisonment and interrogation strategies at the Arthur Road Jail in Mumbai must take the Mumbai police report of the humane treatment of Kasab with an enormous mountain of salt, I would say. However, I think Kasab was actually lucid enough to describe what have been apparently confirmed details, not just about his mission, but also about himself, his disenfranchisement, and his motivation for, the, for participation in the Mumbai attacks, we gather that he was, his family was offered something close to $3,000, the equivalent of $3,000 for this. Um, so I think it's important to recognize that those who engage in this sort of terrorist activity, despite their links, perhaps, 
allegedly to transnational organizations, it's probably very difficult to see the incentives of those who engage in this spectacular violence as universal. And equally important, I think, is the need to recognize that local dynamics in the aftermath of this sort of violence um, are really rooted very much in sort of regional, um, regional politics and, uh, and negotiations. And I think since the Mumbai attacks were so unusual in many ways, they were almost like an urban hijacking that went on for days. They became particularly haunting, I think, for the televisual media. Later, television outlets were deeply criticized by Indians in the aftermath of the attacks when it became known that terrorists holding hostages inside particularly the two luxury hotels and at the Jewish center were being guided on the location of police and commandos via satellite phone by a handler who was watching the news images from very far away. One survivor that I know who played dead for almost 14 hours at one of the luxury hotels said that he watched, actually watched his attackers use the satellite phones to transmit pictures of the carnage inside the hotel in real time. I think the next thing I really want to draw some attention to as we move away, uh, as, I, as I ask for us to move away from some of the existing counterterrorism discourse to understand this particular case, is really the, the problem really of international terrorism in the case of Mumbai. It's not entirely uncomplicated, and in fact, it's very, very contradictory. In some of the public discourse that we have become familiar with, particularly framed through September 11th, um, most the, the this abstraction that occurs in most cases of international terrorism is that abstract idea, the household name, Al-Qaeda. In the case of India, at least at the level of Indian leadership, and I think more even among Indian citizens that I spoke with and its media, there was a very conspicuous resistance to an invocation of the abstraction of Al-Qaeda. For many Indians, despite some evidence which is not quite substantiated yet of Al-Qaeda-like training of these attackers and execution of the attacks, India is pointing directly at regional perpetrators, less abstract for Indians, which is the lashkar e taiba in Pakistan. This could be looked at as a, as a strategic decision because admission to Al-Qaeda links then forces India to once again revisit the problem or the interna internationalization of the territorial dispute in Kashmir. And um, this opens up a whole can of worms for the Indian government, which is to start to actually look at this case in terms of wider discussions on human rights, uh, self-determination, et cetera, et cetera. Now, I would suggest that the Mumbai attacks may possibly, and I say only possibly, help towards some moves away from this staunch regionalization of this border dispute. The third thing I'd like to point to is the reality that India has actually seen terrorism, suicide terrorism, attacks against civilians several times before, in 2008, even before November. Uh, many, many cities, Ahmedabad, Bangalore, Delhi, Gohati, Jaipur, and Malegaon all saw serial bomb blasts in which hundreds of ordinary people were killed and wounded. And the police have arrested many people in these attacks. Unfortunately, um, in, in India, Muslims have actually borne the brunt of much of the trauma in the aftermath of violence and terror. Um, most recently, two Muslim men were gunned down by the Delhi police, for example, in their rented flat under seriously questionable circumstances, claiming that they were responsible for serial bombings in Delhi, Jaipur, and Ahmedabad in 2008. Um, there has been some change in that pattern, very minor change, I will say, in October of 2008, when um, the anti-terror squad in Maharashtra actually investigating the bomb blast in Malegaon, which is a Muslim majority town about 150 miles northeast of Mumbai, uh, where six Muslims were killed and, me and almost 100 were, were injured, they have actually arrested uh, people who belong to one of the several of the Hindu nationalist organizations. The Shiv Sena, the BJP, and the RSS in Maharashtra all condemned the anti-terror squad, vilified its chief, Mr. Hemant Karkare, claiming he was part of a political conspiracy, declaring that Hindus could not actually be terrorists. Um, on November 25th, it was reported that the um, anti-terror squad had actually <clears throat> uh, suggested that the VHP chief, Mr. Praveen Togaria, had a possible role in the Malegaon blasts. The next day, in an extraordinary twist of fate, Hemant Karkare, the head of the anti-terror squad, was killed in the Mumbai attacks. I think, and as Stephen has pointed out already, you know, the, the greatest fear among, among Mumbaikars in the aftermath of Mumbai was this possible eruption of communal violence. In the early aftermath of the attacks, there were some increasingly threatening insinuations by media personalities, veiled and not so veiled anti-Pakistan statements, 
and calls from powerful Hindu nationalist figures for retaliation. These communal fault lines sadly do continue, at least at the rhetorical level. However, um, thankfully, they have not yet been translated into action. Citizens across India's major cities organize what were termed peace marches as, at sites of symbolic importance in many Indian cities. In Mumbai, the march was held at the Gateway of India, only feet away from the Taj Hotel. Uh, the peace march, particularly the one in Mumbai, grew quite vi virulent, rhetorically virulent, and there were a lot of hateful expressions of communalism. I think the, the poster that we see for this panel actually is one of the photographs I gather from that event. Many people that I know actually came away from these peace marches quite disappointed and incredibly distressed. Um, anyway, as I said, thankfully the rhetoric has not been translated into practice and I think Stephen had some pretty interesting analysis of why that has not happened. But I want to point out, I think, to, and to reiterate that in the Indian context, terror and violence actually have many, many faces. Um, Hindu nationalist rhetoric in Maharashtra, I think, has been expressed through various political players. In Mumbai, in the shape of the Shiv Sena Party, the BJP, and more recently, the Maharashtra Navnirman Sena, they're all playing a greater and greater part in eroding Mumbai's cosmopolitan imaginary. And they did, in their own media, actually refer to Indian neighborhoods or Muslim neighborhoods in, in uh, Mumbai as mini Pakistans. This was the Shiv Sena's um, uh, media outlet, Samna, that said this. And while much of this incendiary language has been responsible actually in the past for mobilizing just brutal communal violence in Mumbai, um, this time around it did not have the same potency. So let me come back really to who Indians are actually holding responsible, the regional element in this. They've all, everybody seems to be pointing to the lashkar e taiba I think there's very little agreement and violent debate among Indian citizens about how to actually react to these attacks. But I think the Lashkar's part in the attacks are generally agreed upon. However, it's not uncomplicated. lashkar e taiba is the organization that is said to operate in Pakistani civil society through the jamaat u dawa who was banned by the Pakistani government, apparently, under US and Indian pressure soon after the attacks. However, Lashkar allegedly operates in India through an organization called the Indian Mujahideen. Several Indian nationals have, in fact, been arrested in connection with the Mumbai attacks. So what faces India, really, is the reality of local disenfranchisement, poverty, and brutal, brutal ghettoization of its minorities that seems to create, exacerbate these fault lines and create local complicity and really complicates the allegations of international terrorism. The last thing I would like to address is the ways in which trauma and its aftermath reveal the social cleavages in urban regions. A Mumbai taxi driver actually said to me rather disdainfully, he says, see now the malai or the cream has been hit. This is what will make a difference. And I think Mumbai, this is very critical, and as Stephen pointed to very early on, is that the iconic nature of these attacks is quite interesting. Um, because Mumbai in the last decade has actually seen bomb explosions and alleged terrorist attacks on at least seven different occasions. In 2002 on a public bus, five times in 2003 on a suburban commuter train, then on a, on, on a train station, on a commuter train, on a public bus, in a taxi outside the Taj Hotel in the Gateway of India, in a crowded bazaar, then again in 2006 serial bomb blasts on seven suburban commuter trains at rush hour, all in locations that killed and wounded hundreds and hundreds of common citizens. These made news, but it was business as usual after a few days. So the terror targets really do make a difference. I think it's undeniable that the tremendous visibility of the 2008 attacks and, the and, and then the visibility of the indignation of those who were its victims lies in the fact that for the first time, I think, terrorist violence targeted India's upper classes. Many Indian bureaucrats, prominent business people, knew somebody who has either died or was wounded in one of the luxury hotels. I grew up in South Mumbai myself, just about one building away from the Taj Hotel, and every single one of my school classmates, literally I say every single one, had a story to tell about either being at the hotel or waiting for a friend or relative to come out. I want to re remind people that despite the visual imaginaries of that blazing dome of what was referred to over and over again as the iconic symbol of, the Mum of Mumbai, the luxury Taj Hotel, many of Mumbai's poor and working classes were killed and maimed and wounded in, in attacks that took place at Mumbai's Victoria Terminus, 
No less iconic a 19th century monument, I might, I might say, to Queen Victoria. The Kama Hospital, which is a Parsi maternity hospital that has a largely lower middle class clientele, and also really by stray bullets on densely populated streets of South Mumbai, which is a city with one of the most dense population pressures in the world. So I want to conclude by saying that the resilience of the Mumbaikar was referred to over and over again. The Taj and Oberoi hotels, I think, did a remarkable job amidst the horror and loss to open up their less damaged wings for business only a month after the attacks. The, the Chhatrapati Shivaji uh, termin the station, the Victoria Terminus Station, and the Leopold Cafe were open very soon after as well. But I think Mumbaikars, like most urban citizens in the aftermath of terror, struggle, uh, they, I think, they, they really struggle, I think, to both remember and to forget. But they're also really, really angry. And I think while the heads of many key political figures have already rolled in Maharashtra and at the, at the central uh, level, I think there's now an increasing call to the international community to change the strategy on cross-border terror that has actually been used so far. So I'll stop with that and um, let um, somebody else take over. Thank Thanks. you, Tarani. Um, so now let's pass things over to Professor Martha Nussbaum, who's Ernst Freud uh, professor, uh, Distinguished Service Professor at the Law School. In addition to um, all her work in law, ethics, and philosophy, she has also written extensively on uh, Hindu nationalism in contemporary India. Martha. Okay, well, what's been said so far, mm -hmm. I agree with so much of that it will make my job a lot easier. Uh, I was actually in, in Delhi shortly after the Mumbai incident, and it was remarkable to see how there wasn't um, the backlash that might have been expected, and nor was there uh, tremendous uh, panic or cracking down. Uh, in fact, the conference I was at was one where not only the prime minister, but the foreign minister and many other politicians were speaking. And apart from the usual very heavy security around the PM, uh, things were really pretty normal. There was a kind of perfunctory inspection of the trunks of people's cars but uh, that, uh, that we're familiar with after 9-11, but, but, but it was really quite perfunctory. And so it, it looked like uh, people had drawn the conclusion this is actually a foreign problem to be addressed by diplomatic, let's hope, uh, methods and uh, ultimately in the long run by infiltration of the relevant groups, and it's not a matter which means we have to change radically our daily way of life. However, there's no doubt that certainly in the immediate aftermath and perhaps in a way that percolates beneath the, the current uh, calm, the uh, Islamic affiliation of the attackers feeds a powerful stereotype, powerful both in India and uh, perhaps even more in the US, of the violent and untrustworthy Muslim bent on conquest who can never be a good democratic <coughs> citizen. Uh, these stereotypes, as, as Steve has already mentioned, already shadow the lives of the 13% Muslim population, and uh, they're very, very common in the U.S., maybe even more in, in Europe. Uh, I found, by the way, that when, when I was interviewing people in India, members of the Hindu right, for my book, The Clash Within, it was particularly easy to get them to say the anti-Islamic things that they no doubt uh, believe, because they said to me often, as an American, you will understand how dangerous and how terrible and so on Muslims are. So they, they perceive me as their natural ally. Now, of course, I think it's at this point then that we should take a big step back and try to set this incident in the context of good thought about terrorism in the world generally, which Bob Pape will do, and then in, in, in the Indian context, which I'll try to do here. Uh, as Bob will say, most terrorism in the world is not religiously motivated at all. It has political motivations, not even stemming uh, from religiously affiliated groups in, in many respects, but I'll let him say that. Uh, then, if you study the history of terrorism within India, and you use that word consistently to mean any kind of violence against innocent, the targets innocent civilians that's aimed at stirring up climate of fear and terror and so on, then certainly terrorism is by no means peculiar to Muslims. Uh, by far, the largest amount of terrorism in India has been committed by Hindu right-wing groups. There have been these incidents committed by Islamic groups, most of them having to do with the political struggle over Kashmir. 
But the single most bloody recent incident of terrorism in India was the, the well-known killing of uh, probably up to and around 2,000 uh, Muslim civilians by Hindu right-wing mobs in the state of Gujarat in February 2002. These horrible murders and also rapes, and very often the woman was first raped and then killed, but there were raped survivors that lived to tell the tale. They were portrayed at the time as just what will naturally happen when you have a, a, an incident on the other side, and that means that this uh, explosion of the one car in the train that uh, was carrying Hindu pilgrims coming back from the attempt to reconstruct a Hindu temple on the site of the destroyed Babri Mosque, uh, that was assumed by everyone virtually at the time without any inspection of the forensic evidence or even preservation of the forensic evidence to be a Muslim attack on these Hindu pilgrims. Now let's uh, stop for a minute and talk about that. What had happened, what we know to have happened, is that the train stopped at the Godra station. There were some scuffles between Hindus and Muslims on the station platform. Some Muslim was beaten up because he refused to say Jai Shri Ram, Hail Ram. And there were stories about the possible forcible abduction of a Muslim girl, which probably are unfounded. Then the train pulled out of the station, and then some way into its next uh, trajectory, it, uh, it stopped again, and no one knows quite why somebody had pulled the chain. Well, at that point, Muslims had then gathered in the region. It was a, a region of Muslim dwellings. They had gathered to protest the treatment of Muslims on the station platform. And since the train, the railroad bed, has these little flinty stones, they did start throwing stones at the train. So it is known that Muslims did that. Then the train started up again. And a few minutes later, it stopped again, and no one knows why. And then flames erupted, and this one car of the train was torched. 58 passengers were killed, most of them Hindus. Some were able to crawl to safety. Now, sometime later, with a lot of the crucial evidence no longer in existence, two separate groups investigated the forensic evidence, one of them being a government-appointed uh, commission under the direction of Lalu Prasad Yadav, the Minister of Transportation, the other being a commission of independent engineers, which I, I take to have somewhat greater credibility than the government commission. But in any case, they came to a common conclusion, which was that if you examine the patterns of the burns on the bodies of the victims, what you see is that it could not have been what was initially supposed, which is that Muslims had thrown kerosene-soaked rags, set them alight, and thrown them into the train because the victims were not burned from below. They were burned from above. And in fact, many were able to crawl to safety. So what the best forensic reconstruction of this incident was that it was a flashover phenomenon caused by the accumulation of combustible gases in the train car due to the fact that they had closed the windows so they wouldn't get stones thrown at them. Uh, but in any case, uh, so that the Muslims did provoke them to close the windows, that is sure. What caused the combustion? Well, Indian trains are not well supervised, as anyone who has ever ridden in one knows, and they're usually overcrowded, and this was no exception. There were about twice as many passengers in this car as uh, tickets, and uh, people carried their kerosene stoves, which they were carrying back from the trip, and, and they put them under the seats of the train. So the best guess is that that caused some sort of combustion. The flammable materials in the seats of the train and perhaps the rubber around the windows, and that there was then produced a flashover phenomenon where it was an explosion from above and people were burned. So in other words, it was the, a, a tragic accident, not unlike quite a few other accidents that have taken place in Indian trains. Uh, but anyway, that was not known at the time. What's interesting is that the immediate assumption was made. Muslims have done this, and therefore uh, Muslims are going to be punished. Now, um, there was then a tremendous rushing out of organized Hindu right-wing groups armed with lists of Muslim dwellings, Muslim businesses, and most of them operating quite far from the original site. So the idea that this is retaliation for that incident was always extremely implausible. Evidence that the police were told not to stop the rioting is very solid by now. Leading members of the police have, have uh, come forward. And evidence that the high officials in the state government egged on the perpetrators is so overwhelming that the U.S. State Department removed 
Narendra Modi's uh, tourist visa and denied him a diplomatic visa. This is an ongoing struggle because, as Steve mentioned, Modi is a very popular figure and business groups in the U.S. keep trying to get him to come here. So stay tuned on that one and, um, and, and, and that's still ongoing. However, the accumulation of evidence in very recent times against the state government has, uh, has been very impressive. When I did my study for the book, I interviewed some leading members of Hindu right organizations in Gujarat, like the VHP, but I did it with the assistance of my extremely uh, able uh, Mona Mehta, the, uh, my who was then my research assistant, I think she's somewhere out there in the audience. She's fluent in both Gujarati and Hindi, so she was a great help in getting these people to be trusting and to open up, and they, they saw her as a defenseless Hindu woman who <clears throat> might be threatened by bad Muslim men. So there were remarkable things said to Mona about the badness of, of Muslim men. And so, But all of this was done with the tape recorder running and with the person having signed a release saying that anything in the tape of this interview may be used in a book produced by Harvard University Press. So that, you know, under those circumstances, what they did say was quite uh, remarkable. But more recently, the investigative journal Tehelka conducted an a study on hidden camera and talk to people. And there, what they found is, is really horrible. The interviewees tell how bombs were manufactured in factories owned by members of the Hindu right, how arms were smuggled in from other states, how the police were told to look the other way. And here's a sample quote from one leader of the Badrang Dal, which is a particularly militant kind of street violence oriented group from the Hindu right. Uh, he says, there was this pregnant woman I slit her open, sister fucker, showed them what's what. They shouldn't even be allowed to breed. I say that even today. Whoever they are, women, children, whoever, nothing to be done with them but cut them down. Thrash them, slash them, burn the bastards. The idea is don't keep them alive at all. After that, everything is ours. That is uh, that group. And I think uh, it's important to pause here and say there is an ongoing struggle about what role Modi will play. And in this struggle, the United States is a big player. His re-election campaign had a lot of money flowing in from non-resident Indians. And so anything uh, that happens in this country is likely to affect developments back home. There has been particular concern that the incoming Obama administration has not been as sensitive to these things as it might have been. Uh, Sonal Shah, a woman named to Obama's transition team, has uh, admitted now to having connections with the VHP, one of the Hindu right organizations. Her connections are pretty innocuous. She was supervising some relief efforts after the Gujarat earthquake, but even those efforts were uh, skewed along religious lines. So uh, certainly a number of us in the academy have been involved in protesting that, and at least up till now she hasn't gotten a higher job, so we'll wait and see. But I, th I think it's very important that information makes its way to the new administration about what these groups uh, really are. Another thing that needs to be pointed out is the violence is not just directed against Muslims, it's directed also against uh, Christians. Since the 1930s, this movement has been insisting that India is for Hindus and that both Muslims and Christians are foreigners who should in some way have second class status in the nation. Well, this year in the eastern Indian state of Orissa, they uh, have taken to murdering Christians, uh, Christians who refuse to reconvert to Hinduism because many, many uh, Indian Christians are converts, often from the lowest castes. Peaceful villages in Orissa have been reduced to ashes. A church-run orphanage was torched. Dozens of churches have been destroyed. Missionaries and priests have been murdered. Thousands have been forced to flee their homes. At least 30,000 people in Orissa are currently homeless. And the rallying cry is repeatedly kill Christians and destroy their institutions. This August, the Catholic bishops of India closed Catholic schools all across the country as, quote, a protest against the atrocities on the Christian community and other innocent people. So uh, these are actions aimed at establishing that some people are authentic Indians, other people are foreigners, and they're not going to have a first-class citizenship in the nation. We really have to pay attention to that. Now, as uh, Tarini mentioned, there are other incidents of terrorism in which there, there's strong suspicion that Hindus uh, have played a role, although uh, Kakare, who was attempting to investigate that, was, as she says, uh, very unfortunately cut down. Now, all of that is terrorism. 
and the word terrorism is certainly usable for that if it used in any consistent way at all, and yet we don't hear that word used of that. So the result of this imbalance is a perception, uh, both in India and abroad, that Muslims are the bad guys that we ought to suspect in any incident of terrorist violence. These stereotypes have had a real effect on the lives of Muslims, not just in the general discrimination in jobs and uh, life opportunities that Steve has has, uh, rightly mentioned, but also in the fact that many state bar associations have now stated that they will not defend Muslims accused of terrorism, despite the fact that the Constitution itself in the Directive Principles of State Policy, guarantees to all accused a free legal defense. Moreover, uh, Muslim young people are often rounded up on suspicion of some kind of complicity with terrorism on the flimsiest of evidence in what I have have compared to racial profiling, but of course it often ends up being a whole lot worse because if you can't get an adequate legal defense, it ends up being worse for you. That incident that Tarini mentioned where the two youths were gunned down Uh, ended up uh, having a further uh, consequence. There were a couple of other youths that were arrested who were connected somehow with the ones that were gunned down. And all of this happened in the area of Muslim dwellings close to Jamia Millia, which is a university founded by liberal Muslims who were working with Gandhi, and they wanted to set up an inclusive pluralist university that's affiliated with the, with the nationalist struggle, and that's what Jamia has always been, and so it's not right to call it a Muslim university, but it is a university where about 60% of the students are Muslims. Well, what happened was the vice chancellor of that university, the renowned scholar Mushir al-Hassan, who's already been mentioned here, said that he would pay for their legal defense because it wasn't likely they'd get a good defense uh, elsewhere. They were students enrolled in good standing in the university, And he uh, was immediately charged by BJP politicians of abetting terrorism. Now, notice these were people who were arrested on flimsy evidence, hadn't even faced definite charges, and they had no access to legal defense. Moreover, he was using not the government money that he has, but he was using student activity fees. But nonetheless, he was urged to resign, and they wanted his, his head on a platter. What was interesting to see was what happened next, very similar to what happened after Mumbai, which was that uh, Mushir then addressed the student body, said that Muslims must remember that you are first and foremost good democratic citizens and that your future must be to be more enlightened and more secular in your perspective, not to turn to violence. And then 14,000 students of Jamia followed him on a peace march in which there was no incident that the press, hungry for these kinds of incidents, could even represent as an instance of disruption or violence. So that's the reality of young Muslim lives in India, but the perception is very, very different, and uh, you should have seen the the journalism about this incident. They kept asking Mushir al-Hassan, what are you going to do about Muslim violence? And finally, in some frustration over these uh, questions, he said, well, what do we have to do? Do we have to stand on a balcony and proclaim our loyalty to the nation? Well, evidently, that is indeed what what Muslims have to do in India today. So the fact that there was no backlash is attributable, I think, to the fact that Muslims really did stand on a balcony. I mean, they immediately got together, condemned, uh, as as Steve says, the the, the bombings. They put on black armbands on Eid. They refused burial, uh, as was said, to, to the perpetrators. And so that was standing on a balcony. They shouldn't have had to do that. There shouldn't have been that suspicion directed at them in the first place. So um, this is an ongoing struggle. There's some hopeful signs in the recent elections in Rajasthan and in Delhi, where BJP politicians who played the card of religious violence lost. Uh, the only BJP candidates who have won recently are people who didn't play that card very heavily. But it's something that, that still has to be very, very carefully watched. Modi's a hero to lots of people. So just to conclude, what, what does this all lead us to think? I think the most important thing is that we have to think of terrorism piece by piece and look at each case. It's an internal problem. 
in lots of countries. And what my book was called The Clash Within because I, I said you, you really have to think that in every nation there are people who want to live at peace as good citizens with others who are different by religion and ethnicity. And then there are people who don't. And it's that clash that we have to understand. And we don't understand it if we construct an in international <coughs> Uh, bogeyman, which is Islamic uh, terrorism. That just doesn't help us at all. But I think also at a deeper level that Gandhi was right and the really only way to understand uh, this violence ultimately is to look within the individual person and ask what are the forces in the human being that militate uh, against violence, the forces of compassion and attachment, and then what are the things that, that get people to be polarized and, and violent. And that's uh, something that does have directions for policy because it can tell us what a system of education, for example, should do and not do. There's a lot to be said about the schools in Gujarat that's none too, too happy. Uh, but what, what motives should people be brought up on and what can possibly create a culture of inclusiveness and, and hope? I think in the United States we've had an example recently of how years of different education about race in the public schools has, has produced a nation that for the, for the first time can elect a, a, an African-American president. Uh, but similar things are needed, uh, educational efforts and, and human efforts, in thinking about religion and thinking about Islam in particular. So how can we bring up people who see one another in a way that conduces to good democratic life? Thank you. Um, so next, we'd like to call on my colleague uh, Bob Pape to offer a broader perspective on the phenomenon of uh, suicide terrorism. Uh, I'm just absolutely delighted to be here today. Um, as many on the panel have already said, one of the things we witnessed uh, in the Mumbai attacks was another instance of the demonization of Islam. And I think it's very important to think about what the causes of that might be and then what the reality of the causes of terrorism are. Why is it that it's so easy um, for us to demonize Islam when we see Muslim terrorist attacks? Some people might think it's the Israel lobby. Some of my colleagues in my department think it's the Israel lobby. They think that essentially there are a group of um, uh, mostly American Jews and Christian Zionists that have kind of captured a lot of the news organizations and therefore have kind of demonized Islam, uh, among other uh, things. Well, one of the things that's interesting about the Mumbai attacks is that, of course, if you look at the Indian press, <laughs> you'll see that the Indian press had absolutely no trouble demonizing Islam. And I'm just very skeptical that the Israel lobby has already <laughs> captured the Indian press. Now, maybe I'll find out a little bit later from my colleague that that actually happened. But um, So I tend to think there are some deeper, broader causes to the demonization of Islam. Um, and number one, I think that it's terribly important to recognize that whenever a terrorist attack occurs, you get fear and nationalist anger. That is, terrorism actually does cause these things. Number two, in the immediate aftermath of a terrorist attack, we actually often have very little actual information about what's the motive of the attack. Number three has been the rise of what I call push-button journalism. Um, it's the case, uh, Martha knows this very well, those of us who go on the press, we know that there are often now dozens of media outlets, very many dozens actually, and very few of them, because their budgets are so thin, have anything like an investigative staff. <laughs> You're lucky if they have a producer who's able to know, get your name right before they throw you on. Um, and the fact of the matter is you put all these three things together and you end up with some really uh, likely you're likely going to get uh, a quick reach for a quick explanation, which then gets percolated over and over again. Well, what I'd like to, um, and by the way, before I go on to the details, I'd just like to say Martha, in particular, was a major exception in this particular case. Because Martha immediately, instead of just doing push-button journalism, uh, wrote a serious uh, analysis in the LA Times. Um, in fact, uh, came right out and made the case that it was political grievances that were most likely at the bottom of the Mumbai attacks. And then, of course, she was roundly criticized <laughs> and challenged by all those others out there in 
push-button journalism land, um, who really uh, were not as expert as Martha. Um, and so what I'd like to do today is talk a bit about, first of all, what are the general causes of suicide terrorism around the world? And then what specifically do we know about the causes of the Mumbai attacks, which were at least a suicide mission, if not the classic instance of uh, a suicide terrorist attack. So I think with that, um, many of you probably know that I spend uh, quite a bit of my life collecting <laughs> statistics on suicide terrorism. Um, I have a team of a dozen researchers fluent in all the key native languages, Arabic, Hebrew, Tamil, Russian. Um, they each spend about 20 hours a week doing this, <laughs> uh, believe it or not. And um, this is generously funded by uh, the Defense Department, Carnegie Corporation in New York, Argonne National Laboratories, a wide variety of uh, sources. Well, the data uh, that I've been collecting really comes in two uh, major parts. That is, the first 24 years of suicide terrorism around the world, from 1980 to 2003, and then the uh, last five years of suicide terrorism, uh, 2004 to 2008. Um, and what I want to do is I want to tell you about those general patterns first, and then I want to conclude by what we specifically know about um, uh, the Mumbai su uh, 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 suicidal attacks. Uh, if we could have the next slide, please, or am I pushing the slides? Ah, excellent. Uh, the mo probably the most important thing that the data on suicide terrorism shows is that the conventional wisdom that suicide terrorism is a product of Islamic fundamentalism is just simply misleading. It's wrong. Um, suicide terrorism and Islamic fundamentalism are not as closely associated as many people think. Overall, from 1980 to the end of 2003, there were 315 completed suicide terrorist attacks around the world. The world leader in this period is a group many people don't know much about, although this audience may because of the Indian nature of the, the world they're, they're interested in. The world leader is the Tamil Tigers in Sri Lanka. They're a Marxist group, a secular group, a Hindu group. They've done more suicide attacks than Hamas or Islamic Jihad, and they're still ahead of Hamas to this day. Further, at least 30% of all Muslim suicide attacks are by purely secular groups such as the PKK in Turkey, which is a Marxist, read, anti-religious suicide terrorist group. Overall, in this 24-year period, at least 50% of all suicide attacks were not associated with Islamic fundamentalism. Uh, instead of religion, what nearly 95% of all suicide terrorist attacks around the world have in common is a specific secular and strategic objective to compel a democratic state to withdraw combat forces. I don't mean advisors with sidearms. I mean tanks, fighter vehicles, and armor units from territory the terrorists consider to be their homeland or prize greatly. As you can see from this slide, the, uh, from Lebanon to Sri Lanka to the West Bank to Iraq, what all nine disputes that account for 95% of all of the suicide terrorism all around the world from 1980 to 2003 have in common is that terrorists were fighting for self-determination for territory that they prize. That was the central objective. Well, what's happened just recently? Well, most recently, Oh, I'm sorry, before we get to most recently, um, one of the things that our team has done um, is we've collected a group of martyr videos. And I'd like to just take a couple minutes out to not just talk about data, but I'd like to have uh, some of the terrorists I've just referred to um, uh, tell you in their own words why they did it. And what I want to do is I want to show you six of the most infamous suicide terrorists. Uh, four of the 9-11 hijackers, uh, uh, four from Saudi Arabia, uh, their martyr videos came out um, uh, several months and then several years after their attack, um, and also two of the 7-7 bombers. And if we could have the gentleman who knows, yes, who could come in, I'd just like to have you listen to, you, let them tell you uh, why they did it. Now, some we've had to translate in subtitles, so you'll have to, you know, please look closely when we get, especially to the 9-11 hijackers, we'll be speaking in Arabic. Uh, the first person you're about to see is one of the 7-7 uh, bombers. That's Mohammed Khan. He's the ringleader of the July 2005 London suicide attacks by al-Qaeda. Um, and he's about to tell you why he's doing it. Then what's going to happen is we're going to go to the four 9-11 hijacker uh, 
uh, uh, martyr videos. And then what we're going to do is go to another one of the 7-7 uh, bombers, uh, one of Mohammed Khan's uh, accomplices. And hopefully we've got it. This is how our ethical stances are dictated. Um, your de democratically elected governments continuously perpetuate atrocities against my people all over the world. And your support of them makes you directly responsible, just as I am directly responsible for protecting and avenging my Muslim brothers and sisters. Until we feel security, you will be our targets. And until you stop the bombing, gassing, imprisonment and torture of my people, we will not stop this fight. We are at war and I am a soldier. وأقول للقيادة الأمريكية إن أرادت سلامة جيوشها وشعبها فلتسحب جميع قواتها من بلاد المسلمين ولتخرج من جميع أراضيهم وإلا فلتنتظر اللجان ولتجهز توابيتها وتحفر قبورا لأبنائها ولتستعد لأن تذوق الويل والوبال القادم على قياداتها وشعبها بإذن الله وهي من المصائب العظام التي يصيبت بها الأمة الإسلامية هي احتلال بلاد الحرمين من قبل الجيوش اليهودية الصليبية وعلى رأسها أمريكا وإن هذا الاحتلال أكبر خيانة وكارثة في تاريخ الإسلام ولم تغز جزيرة العرب مثل هذه الجيوش الأمريكية الجبارة التي تمخر أساطيلها بحار الجزيرة وتضلل طائراتها سماء المنطقة وتذب فيارقها طوق ترابها أسألكم بالله تعالى ماذا يجري اليوم في بلاد المسلمين احتلال واضح لا غبار عليه وأنتم أيها العلماء تقولون هذا وتقرونه حتى لبلاد الحرمين كيف لا ونحن قد دهنا في بيت ربنا ومسجد نبينا وقبلتنا ومقدساتنا واحتللنا من قبل اليهود والنصارى وهي أعظم مصيبة بعد مصيبة وفاة الرسول صلى الله عليه وسلم ومما يزيدها عظما أن هذا الاحتلال تم بالتعاون مع الحكام المرتدين وجزيرة العرب منذ أن خلق الله صحراءها وحفها ببحارها لم يدهمها مثل هذا البلاء قط فإنا لله وإنا إليه راجعون وما بلاد الحرمين فيه من احتلال وتردي هو مخطط من اليهود والنصارى وعلى رأسهم أمريكا دمرها الله التي ما نزل بالإسلام والمسلمين من مصيبة إلا كانت سببا فيها What you have witnessed now is only the beginning of a series of attacks which inshallah will intensify and continue until you put all your troops out of Afghanistan and Iraq until you stop all financial and military support to the US and Israel and until you release all Muslim prisoners from Belmarsh and your other concentration camps and know that if you fail to comply with this then know that this war will never stop and that we are ready to give our lives 100 times over for the cause of Islam you will never experience peace until our children in Palestine, our mothers and sisters in Kashmir, our brothers in Afghanistan and Iraq feel peace. Now I'm showing you these videos not to justify murder. Suicide terrorism is murder, and these people are not just killing themselves, they are murdering innocents. But if we're going to confront suicide terrorism, if we're actually going to stop the phenomenon, if we're actually going to try to come to grips with it, it's terribly important that we recognize the actual motive that's driving walk-in volunteers. That's what these are. These are not longtime members of a terrorist organization, whether it's trained or drilled. None of them went to a madrasa. These are just walking volunteers who are motivated by the plight of atrocities, especially atrocities under a military occupation, a foreign military occupation, and they see themselves as defending those communities. Unless we take those grievances seriously, then we're likely to either have no effect on the phenomenon or actually make matters worse. 
Well, so what's happened to suicide terrorism in the last five years? And then, of course, with Lumber. Uh, our team has just recently updated uh, the global patterns of suicide terrorism all around the world since 2004. We've done it through June of uh, 2008. And, as you can see, it probably comes as no surprise that Iraq is the largest suicide terrorist campaign. Uh, some of you may be surprised that Afghanistan is so large um, because it's uh, actually grown especially since 2005. Um, and some of you may already know that many of those other campaigns I pointed out uh, were continuing uh, and going on. And we're going to talk about Kashmir in just a moment. Well, the key thing you should notice, though, from this chart is since our invasions and occupations of Afghanistan and Iraq, which never had suicide attacks in their history prior to our occupation. Uh, since then, 89% of all the suicide terrorism occurring around the world is now anti-American inspired suicide terrorism. Uh, this is not true in Mumbai, but it is true of what, it's something that Americans need to take uh, into account because this is a dangerous condition for us uh, in the world. We just make a point about uh, what the data, and I'm not, by the way, that's 89%, not even counting Pakistan. So I'm going to not even count the Pakistan attacks uh, as for that pattern. Um, overall, this is strong confirmation for the strategic logic of suicide terrorism, that foreign military occupation and the threat of foreign military occupation is the principal driver of suicide terrorism. Altogether, from 1980 to the summer of 2008, we have 1,670 double-confirmed suicide attacks. For this pattern, for this explanation to be wrong, we would have to miss not five suicide attacks around the world, not even 50 around the world. There would literally have to be hundreds of suicide attacks that have occurred around the world, especially in these last five years, that are not in countries on this chart. I don't mean that Iraq you know, maybe could have been 900 instead of 800. I mean, there would have to be hundreds showing up in countries not on this chart. Well, I can't absolutely guarantee you our team has got every last one. I think we've gotten, I don't think we've even missed five, but I don't think we've missed hundreds. And if you think we have, you should be able to tick off <laughs> some pretty big suicide terrorist campaign. Uh, and so the fact is, the data increasingly shows that it's foreign military occupation that's driving suicide terrorism. So, what's happening in Kashmir? Well, Kashmir uh, and Mumbai is a prime example, continued to fight until they themselves were killed and they knew they were going to, uh, they, they were going to die. Um, Mumbai, uh, in Kashmir, uh, for those of you who don't know, uh, Kashmir is occupied by 300,000 Indian combat troops. Uh, that's occupying a population of 9 million, majority Muslim population. India and Pakistan have fought two wars over uh, Kashmir, uh, 1947 and 48, most recently 1965. And since then, there have been a whole series of various rebellions, uh, with leading to 38,000 dead Kashmiri Muslims. It's not a small number of people who have died in Kashmir. So, coming to Mumbai, what do we know about the causes of the Mumbai attacks? Well, actually, we know something fairly uh, unusual in this particular case. We actually have direct evidence in real time from one of the key attackers. Uh, in this particular case, one of the key attackers called an Indian television station. Um, and the Indian uh, uh, surveillance, uh, because he did it on a cell phone, picked up the conversation and the Indian government has transcribed it. Um, and so many are wondering, well, is it, you know, the terrorist group in Pakistan, dot, dot, dot. We don't even have to go there. We can just go right to one of the attackers, who's then later killed that day, okay, so he dies, um, and we can find out from him why he thinks he's killing him, he's willing to die. The Indian television news anchor says to him, asks him, you're surrounded, you're definitely going to die, why don't you surrender? And Weber says, are you aware how many people have been killed in Kashmir? Are you aware of how many your army, uh, uh, of how your army has killed Muslims? We die every day. It's better to win one day as a lion than to die this way. 
That's his last will and testament. <laughs> Um, then he goes on uh, to list the grievances that, is, that are driving him. Number one is India's control over Kashmir, and I just told you that's 38,000 plus dead. Uh, number two was the 92 uh, 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 Hindu mob attack uh, on a mosque, uh, killing over 2,000. Uh, and then the 2002 uh, uh, riots in uh, Gujarat State, which I'm sorry was mis mis misspelled it, uh, 1,000 dead. So what are the implications? I think the implications are, first, uh, Mark and the other panelists are essentially right. Uh, political grievances are what's driving this. Uh, I think it's what's driving suicide terrorism in general. And I think the best information we have is that it is what drove the Mumbai attackers in detail. Uh, second, any serious solution to terrorism, uh, uh, especially suicidal terrorism um, uh, in India, uh, has got to come to grips with political grievances. Uh, the idea that we're going to continue to demonize Islam and somehow expect that's actually going to diminish <laughs> the terrorism we face, as opposed to simply foster it, um, is probably mistaken. Uh, you should recognize that many of the terrorist groups probably love the fact that our Western media demonizes <laughs> Islam. <laughs> this greatly, <laughs> greatly helps them make the case that the West hates Islam, that is, it hates so much that they'll have double standards willing to allow military atrocities to occur uh, to Muslims. And so the demonization of Islam is something that, in fact, feeds into at least the outer edges of the motivations driving suicide terrorism. So overall, um, I'm just delighted that Martha uh, was willing to write that out there. Thank you. Thanks very much, uh, Bob. Uh, our last uh, commentator is Manan Ahmed. He's going to talk about the Pakistani uh, side of things, um, what's happening on that side of the border. Manan is a recent graduate um, of the history program here with the doctor and also a well known uh, blog, blogger and commentator on uh, contemporary politics. So, thank you. Um, thank you to the organizers of the panel. It's been, uh, Really, really illuminating for me. Um, listen to our co-panelists. I'm um, I don't know how to follow up on Bob's presentation. <laughs> uh, both chilling and um, I'm definitely well presented. Um, I, I was unsure as to what I could contribute uh, in real time to this panel, and uh, luckily for me, yesterday the Senate hearings were going on, um, and that's all I really needed to hear. So yesterday at uh, the Senate confirmation hearing for Senator, Senator Clinton, um, the issue of Pakistan and Afghanistan uh, came up again and again. Her most detailed conversation um, was with Senator Kerry, who will head the powerful Foreign Relations Committee. Kerry spoke about his trip to South Asia in the immediate aftermath of the Mumbai attacks. And in, in describing his trip, uh, he says, quote, we do not live there. He's talking about Afghanistan and Pakistan. We do not live in a community, in a hamlet, in a small town, a pocket, whatever you want to call it. And so we're not there often at night. They are. And the night often rules with the insurgency. Unquote. It is a profoundly illuminating statement. The interplay of light and dark, day and night. The references to hamlets and pockets. Insurgency, which is the unique lexical contribution of the Iraq war. They live there. We don't. That language of globalization, which rules the pages of Wall Street Journal and New York Times, is distinctly absent. There are no interconnected communities that stretch across the national borders. These are all inwardly focused, pre-modern histories. To further explain, Kerry mentioned that he has been doing a lot of reading recently. Readings that impressed upon him the importance of, quote, tribalism. Quote, we honored tribalism when we dealt with the Northern Alliance and initially went into Afghanistan. We really haven't adequately since." Unquote. So he recommends to Senator Clinton that she read a few of the good books that he has been reading on the subject of Pakistan and Afghanistan. He mentions Rory Stewart's travelogue of walking across Pakistan and Afghanistan um, called The Places in Between. 
Um, he also mentioned Janet Wallach's biography of Gertrude Bell, which is entitled, and I do want you to understand the full title, Desert Queen, The Extraordinary Life of Gertrude Bell, Adventurer, Advisor to King, Ally of Lawrence of Arabia. Senator Clinton responded warmly to Lip Carey's literary suggestions. Quote, sitting here today, when I think about my trips to Afghanistan, my flying over that terrain, my awareness of the history going back to Alexander the Great, and certainly the British military and Rudyard Kipling's memorable poems about Afghanistan, the Soviet Union, which put in more troops than we're thinking about putting in. I mean, it calls for a large dose of humility about what it is that we're trying to accomplish, unquote. The historian in me is fascinated by these display, uh, by the di display of these teleologies, Alexander to the British to the Soviets to us, a timeline of invaders and conquerors who can only abide the day but not the night, an emphasis on the romantic and the orientalist, a vocabulary of time and space that does not mesh at all with the world that the rest of us seem to inhabit. It is also explicitly a teleology of failed imperial instances. I, I don't know if Carrie or Senator Clinton were um, sort of consciously aware of this. The tribalism, however, that Kerry says is something unique to Afghanistan, is in fact not. The burden of tribalism is explicitly the burden of violence on colonial subjects, be they the Hindus and Muslims under British colonial rule in the early decades of the 20th century, um, the aftermath of which is in the Gujarat riots and other communal riots in India to this day, um, or the Sunnis and Shias in Baghdad during the surge these colonial histories are written in that language, a particular language of tribal violence. And these are particular violent solutions to political problems, to be exact. Reading the United U.S. press, Kerry, and you listen to Senator Kerry and Clinton, is to know that Pakistan does not exist as a coherent nation state. It seems to comprise of undifferentiated security actors, Karzai, Northern Alliance, the Taliban, the military, um, Musharraf until very recently, ISI, operating in a volatile suit. It is constantly claimed that the state, whether civil or military, does not control its own western and southwestern territories, a fact that enables the U.S. to conduct drone attacks, missile attacks, as well as military incursions into the country. In the first seven months of 2008, there were five U.S. missile drone attacks inside Pakistan. Since August, there have been over 30, 30 additional, some as deep as 25 miles inside Pakistan. Pakistani territory, territory, and all of them collectively very deadly to the civilian populations. Adding yet another sort of tick mark to the um, grievance list that um, um, Professor Pape was just talking about. <clears throat> and this history, this history of these, these violent um, interventions in the Pakistan state, is not the history of Alexander's arrival to the Indus. Um, from 1999 to 2008, we supported the military dictatorship of General Pervez Musharraf. He was the devil we know, we knew and liked. From 2002 to 2008, the same devil watched as the white swathes of his country converted into a war zone. In 2005, to suppress the proto-nationalist uprising in Balochistan, he used the same tactics that were being practiced across the border in Afghanistan by NATO and the United States. Bombing areas where there are civilians, missile assassinations, heavy military rollouts. As he methodically destroyed the claimants for an engaged and equal partnership of Balochistan and the federal military regime, he created, in fact, the political part of space for the emergence of new actors. The Mahsub tribe in Waziristan, um, which is now sort of controlling a large part of that um, territory where we think Al-Qaeda slash uh, Mullah Omar are residing. Pakistan, by the end of 2008, then faced several civil wars. In the northwest, it faces the development of self-declared Taliban regime, which is hoping to enforce Sharia. This is in the Swat territory. In the southwest, which is Balochistan and Waziristan, it faces the proliferation of both a proto-nationalist and terrorist groups. In the city of Karachi itself, there is a systematic effort to expel Afghan slash Pakhtun immigrants by the ethnic party MQM, and all of these is contributing to a overall state of intense chaos in a nation already uh, deemed chaotic. But previously to that, since we're doing a history lesson. Previously to that, we supported two other de decade-long military dictatorships. General Ziaul Haq, 1977 to 1988. During his tenure, we fought our hot cold war in Afghanistan, 
and during whose tenure we excused a rampant policy of Sunnification and militarization. The Taliban, in fact, a um, exact um, byproduct. And also Field Marshal Ayub Khan uh, from 1958 to 1969, whose tenure saw the effective killing of democratic institutions and the highlighting of Kashmir as a central issue of Pakistan. We supported all three men. They came to our capital. They slept in our White House. They enjoyed days and nights as our esteemed friends. Overall, in the 61 years of <clears throat> Pakistan's existence, we have supported 30 plus years of military rule. During the civilian administrations, um, by contrast, the Nawaz Sharif, Benazir Bhutto, um, twice on both, we have routinely ignored Pakistan or imposed sanctions. If Pakistan lacks coherence as a nation state, we can look to these specific histories for explanation. Alexander the Great cannot help us. In the aftermath of Mumbai attacks, the world found yet another reason to doubt the sustainability of Pakistan, doubt the intentions of the people in the state, doubt their commitment to being a peaceful global citizen. Those doubts, those proclamations, some of the harsh denouements of the Indian media were heard loudly and clearly across Pakistan. The bellicosity, apparent even in the flyer for this panel, for example, generated its own predictable response. The military, which had finally lost all credence, is back in business. It is the protector. It is the sustainer of the national myths. It can now bomb its own citizens with impunity. The Pakistanis are also attuned to the silences. They note that in the teleology of modern terror, um, New York City, Madrid, London, now Bombay, there is no mention of Lahore and Islamabad. The September 20th blast at the Marriott Islamabad is a clear precursor to the tragedy at the Taj. It, too, was a site where the local elite gathered for daily mingling. It, too, catered to the foreign visitors. It, too, was a sign of Pakistan's growing economy. Yet, while New York City and Mumbai are forever linked, the 9-11 and 26-11 um, being the sort of um, big signifiers here, <clears throat> the victims of Islamabad and Lahore find themselves on the other side of history. But the global context is certainly clear to the terrorists in Mumbai. In the violence they spread, over three days and their targets and their statements. They drew upon yet another teleology of political violence. Nariman House to Gaza, Kashmir to the Taj Hotel, are not teleologies of tribalism, and we make a great, grave error if we read them wrongly. The Obama administration will need to stop reading Rudyard Kipling and start reading the wide circulation dailies, whether Urdu or English from Pakistan. It's not that hard to do. Uh, they're all available online. It will have to know Pakistan's hopes will lie with civilian institutions, civic bodies which protect women and minorities, elementary and secondary education, strengthening the judiciary, invoking land reform. It will have to note that the military is the largest land-owning entity, one of the biggest business entities, and the greatest consumer of U.S. aid. The Obama administration needs to focus on the people of Pakistan in the present and not in some distant past surrounded by um, unknown terrain. Collectively, there are over 200 million inhabitants in Afghanistan and Pakistan. I say that again, 200 million. There are mega cities like Karachi with populations over 19 million. This is not hamlets and pockets. Ironically, 2008 began as one of the greatest moments in the history of Pakistan. After a year-long civic protest led by the lawyers' movement, the people of Pakistan democratically voted out the military dictator, uh, Pervez Musharraf. The February elections in Pakistan were a resounding dismissal of a decade of military dominance as well as a, a rejection of religious parties. Yet we fail to engage with this flowering of democracy, and we need to engage with this present civilian government of Zardari, however flawed that particular person is. There are no military solutions to a decades-old political problem because military solutions mandate that the language of political violence be the only language left, be it in Kashmir or Islamabad or Mumbai. Thank you uh, very much to all the panelists. We've got about 10 minutes if people would like to make comments or ask questions. Um, Karan, do we have a thing with uh, anybody has a question or a comment? Yes, this gentleman. Um, I think that uh, diplomacy is um, um, uh, the heart of what Obama has put forward um, as uh, sort of the underused tool of American policy during the Bush administration. 
Uh, and I think that it's also quite obvious that um, unless there's a, a sort of a political track uh, for Kashmir that has some meaning to it, that you're going to continue to see the violence track. Uh, I mean, this is, uh, you know, there aren't that many <laughs> uh, real alternatives. Um, and I think that uh, the fact is um, it would be um, uh, not just uh, sort of an, a, a, a for, for the United States to be involved um, in encouraging um, a political, uh, a serious political dialogue uh, on Kashmir um, is not just a sort of instance of social work. That is a nice moral thing to do. Uh, the fact of the matter is what Osama bin Laden um, often gets credit for um, uh, in um, uh, supporting the terrorist groups that he supports uh, um, in uh, those tribal regions of Pakistan is helping them <laughs> uh, foment their struggle in Kashmir. So this is one of the key reasons that so many folks in Western Pakistan love Osama. <laughs> uh, Osama is more uh, is probably the most popular political leader in Pakistan right now. Um, and if we're really going to uh, uh, sort of cut into that, then um, putting helping um, uh, Kashmir move on to a serious political track is probably our best bet. At the back. There's a I, microphone I think, at the front. Yeah, people need like to come to. up to the microphone uh, in order to ask questions. Thanks. <laughs> if we use the hypothesis that Kashmir is what was behind the Mumbai attacks, then why were Western targets and Jewish targets attacked? Mm -hmm. There were 165 people killed in uh, the Mumbai attacks. Of those 165, eight were Americans or Israelis. Um, three of them specifically were Americans, um, and five of them were Israelis. Um, as best we can tell, the reason the five Israelis were killed is because the Indian government has been buying a tremendous number of weapons from Israel just in the last four years. Um, and so they're just calling attention to the fact that there is a relationship here between India and Israel's weapon industry. But that said, I think it's terribly important to recognize <laughs> that nearly 90% of the people being killed here <laughs> have nothing to do with Americans or Israelis. I, I was really quite stunned, by the way. I'm watching the news just like everybody else in the first day of the attacks, and I'm listening to the news reporters saying, oh, my God, they're going through these hotels, and they're picking out every American they see with a passport, and they're putting bullets in their heads. And then we find out that's not true, <laughs> that, those, that those initial reports that were coming out and kind of floating all over cable news, which I'm sure has now become the conventional wisdom of who was being killed, just had no bearing in reality. Um, the reality is uh, these, um, th this was basically an attack that is really driven against Hindus. I wonder whether we could look at the logic of suicide terror um, upside down or the other side of the coin that one could say and this is almost paraphrasing what you were saying, that it's caused by an excessive legitimacy accorded to self-determination, mm -hmm. or another way of saying that, a failure to make multi-sectarian, multi-ethnic states work. And a big example of that was the partition of India in the first place, that we would not have the Kashmir crisis if, as a lot of people wanted to do, India had not been partitioned and it had become uh, a federation. And of course, one could point to mm -hmm. the breakup of Yugoslavia, uh, the breakup of Sudan, mm -hmm. and, and so on. So that uh, although mm -hmm. we see a kind of immediate cause, maybe there's a cause of a context that allows it to happen, which is really a failure to provide a just federal states that. Uh, keep groups together. Yeah, I'd, I'd like to pick up slightly on that. It's not the multi-ethnicity that's the problem. It's the just federal aspect that's the problem. India's great achievement is to actually have a thriving multi-ethnic democracy that, despite its many problems, has provided a better home, I, I, I think, for its um, various ethnic groups because it's been a genuinely federal state that's devolved power to the units. And Pakistan, right from the get-go, has failed to do that. Within three or four years after independence, every major province in Pakistan is under some form or the other of emergency rule in just the first few years after independence. You don't have a political party like the Congress that genuinely incorporates all the different elements 
uh, all the different ethnic groups that got to make the state. And Pakistan has never, I would argue, been able to solve this since the point of independence. It's never been a genuine multi-ethnic federal democracy. And that's been the problem. It's not the multi-ethnicity, it's the political institutions, the military, the ethnic imbalance that inherited from British India. That's been the problem. Yeah. Yeah. This, is for, this is for Mr. Ahmed. And uh, I was reading Barnett Rubin's, a couple of his pieces about the Northwest Frontier Province and the Awami Party's victory in the elections over the MMA, at, or, well, the, uh, over, over the Islamists. The, and I was just wondering, what your hopes are, what the Northwest Frontier Province or Pakhtunwa and the, what the U.S. can do to support the state building aspects in there and probably need to explain like a little bit of the history and the disenfranchisement of the people in those provinces and how big a challenge is and how much hope you have that the Awami Party can actually fix some, some of the big problems in there. So. I, mean, I think... Um Steve is actually um, right on the money in the fact that the lack of um, lack of political participation for wide wide populations in Pakistan's different states have been have contributed over the years to where there is a hegemonic pr uh, presence in the center. The hegemony being the military and the military institutionalization of um, civic civil life throughout um, throughout Pakistan. The parties, even um, it's hard to remember now that the um, the late Benazir put to bequeath a political party to her son, um, that PPP was also a very um, secular um, party in its beginning um, with some socialist leanings, um, which Bhutto, Bhutto sort of corrected. But the, the hope is exactly um, some way of legitimizing democratic um, elections within the constitutional um, slash military understanding of the country. Um, this is not going to happen until um, the key players in the, in the region, India, United States, Iran, Afghanistan, China, and obviously the Pakistani military, um, think that this is in their interest, uh, the, sort of a, the strengthening of democratic institutions. Um, that just has never happened throughout the history of Pakistan, that realization that democracy may be a good thing uh, within Pakistan. Um, my hope is once Senator Kerry and Clinton are done reading Rudyard Kipling is that they can uh, maybe uh, send an envoy, as they have, uh, some people have said, to address the Kashmir issue, um, and that maybe regional forces like Iran um, and India uh, can be put on the same table to discuss Afghanistan um, and its sort of uh, spillover into Western Pakistan. But other than that, um, it's very hard to, to project a future in which the military will uh, cede control um, voluntarily, um, despite the anomaly of 2008. Just one thing to add to that. If, if uh, turnout rates in elections are one sign of how well people regard the strength of their democracy, Pakistan's doing appallingly badly uh, by that. You've got in the 20 to 30% range. Uh, one of the great triumphs of, of the Indian system is very high degrees of participation and actually higher degrees of participation by people at the bottom of the social scale compared with those at the top. Uh, and in Pakistan, you've seen very, very low levels and declining levels of political participation over the years. I suppose this question is for anyone who chooses to answer it. <clears throat> um, right, this uh, will be the back, final question. Uh, okay. uh, going back to earlier on in the discussion when you were talking about how there hasn't been much religious backlash or communal yeah. violence in the aftermath of the attacks. Uh, the last year and a half or so has seen Raj Thakre and the MNS in Bombay you know, try to engender this anti-non-Maharashtrian feeling, so this strong sense of Maharashtrian and Mumbaikar pride, yeah. and uh, most notably in this much-publicized feud with the uh, Bollywood icon Amitabh Bachchan. And uh, I know there's been a tremendous amount of criticism and a uh, backlash against uh, Thakre and the MNS, and uh, just this feeling that such communal sentiments are unwarranted, and I, without suggesting that there's this homogeneous rational part in our mind that assigns all our actions to just communal jingoism, do you think that in some way this has tempered the way people approach these issues in general, or just blind hatred for uh, people mm. come from communities separate from us? Mm. Um, I guess I'll. I'll take a stab at that. One thing is that if you look at public opinion polling data in India, the limited public opinion polling data that we have, 
suggest that um, that there's a sort of tolerant majority in India that's not in favor of the disenfranchisement of minority communities in general that doesn't want violence to take place against its minority populations. Uh, yes, they're afraid of terrorism. They're afraid of uh, you know, threats to the integrity of the Indian nation. But there's a fundamental tolerance amongst the Indian population uh, that provides a political um, reason for people not to foment these kinds of campaigns. And there are these signs of exhaustion. Now, the, the Shiv Sena and Bal Thakri, the interesting thing there is that they've switched over the years. They started life as an anti-migrant uh, you know, uh, party against Southerners, and then they switched, and then they did very badly with one or two, um, you know, union campaigns and local politics, and they switched to an anti-Muslim agenda, and now they've switched to something else. They're a party um, that, that definitely is always premised on the other, but they're definitely willing to switch their ideology over the uh, years, depending on which one seems to be working at any particular time. I think um, the the wonderful thing about India is that uh, there is no single unifying identity that can be used to permanently other another group because Indians are cross-cut by so many different uh, caste, regional, linguistic, and other identities. And from the perspective of somebody like me who's interested in what are the conditions for ethnic peace, that's a marvelous thing because it means that you can't win without making deals with other groups. And that has a powerful imperative towards tolerance. And Indians are also deeply attached to democracy, and that provides a means that no one individual can come along and change the rules, that you have to work this out through a democratic process. So yes, you're going to see these damaging kinds of campaigns occasionally, but the overall tendencies, I think, in India are very good uh, because of the amazing diversity of the country, its institutions, and an overall commitment to democracy. I don't know if anybody else would like to add to Yeah, I mean, I guess I'd just like to add the whole, you know, the MNS, I think, in, in, in Maharashtra, um, is, is attempting to cap, recapture a certain mood. You know, it's a new political party. It's trying to recapture um, sort of, you know, what the Shiv Sena was able to do in the 1960s. Uh, and I think it's, uh, it's, it's failing, thankfully, um, be, because of this, exactly what Stephen has been talking about, this very uh, fairly, you know, vibrant uh, commitment in many ways to pluralism, notwithstanding, I mean, there have been a fair amount of, uh, you know, examples of, of, um, of, of communal um, violence and things like that. But I think the MNS, um, there was a great deal of criticism, I think, uh, by ordinary Mumbaikars, Maharashtrians, people who possibly may even electorally have voted for the MNS um, in, in the wake of the Mumbai attacks. I mean, I think, you know, Raj Thakare presenting himself as sort of the savior of Mumbai and the, the person responsible for redefining who and who, who can and who cannot be a Mumbaikar. Um, I think um, he had a tremendous amount of silence after the Mumbai attacks, and he was deeply, deeply criticized for that. So, uh, and I think there's, um, that, that was a fairly hopeful uh, result, I think, for um, you know, the, the strength and um, vibrancy of, of a certain kind of pluralism in Mumbai, despite these um, sort of you know, voices trying to erode in many ways what is a very cosmopolitan um, environment. So. Okay, on that note, um, Martha had to leave uh, for an event at the law school, but we're certainly grateful to her, to our other panelists here, and to all of you for coming. So thank you very much.